anyway. <laughs> it takes four seconds. No, don't take it away from him. Because he was asking a question. <laughs> Interest, interesting law of attraction, though. <laughs> You have another woman taking something away from you. It's not, it's not the first one. It's not the first time, is it? No. <laughs> Far away. Um, yeah, your incarnation is good. Um, the one bit that doesn't fit very well yep. is the potluck deal. Yep. It seems like a very inequitable deal that you just get a roll of the dice where you get to start the game. Can I be more specific to you? I said the words potluck, but in reality this is what happens. It's very complicated. But the, a person incarnates based on the personality of the soul incarnating and the attractions based around the people that it's incarnating into. So the personality of the person incarnating into a place to challenge its parents is always there. There's always, And many of you have noticed this with the generation now of children. The generation now of children are the most challenging generation of their own parents. And the reason why this is, is God designed this per perfect system that if you can't notice the damage you're doing to your own child, how are you ever going to have enough love to notice anything else? Can I say that again? If you can't notice the damage you're doing to your own child, how are you ever going to notice the damage you're doing to anyone else, including yourself? So what God's created was this system where the personality of the child would challenge you in every possible way. And you have the option of shutting down this child. In other words, you have the option of treating the child in an unloving manner or you have the option of treating the child in a loving manner and actually working your way through the emotions inside of yourself that creates this child responding in the manner that it does. God created this system to bring humanity back to a state of perfection. But unfortunately, humanity finishes up blaming the children. <laughs> I don't know why, because when you think about it, it's not very logical. Like the children are being brought into this damaged environment and we damage them further by telling them that it's their fault they're in this damaged environment. That's not a very uh, loving thing to do, obviously, but this is what we do. And so by the time the child grows up to an adult, it thinks it's to blame for what's, you know, what's been created before it. The truth is that we can change this. We can change all of these things, but we need to make the choice to change it. So, so from a reincarnation perspective, even if many of us in the future reincarnate, it's really in a way immaterial. What we need to do is address the problems that are here right now. And the problems that are here right now are all based around our own demands that are unloving. Our own demands, not the demands of other people, because <laughs> I can't change your demands. All I can do is change my demands upon you that are unloving. And so what I need to do is focus on my own life and what's unloving inside of me. And when I focus on that, and if you have the option to focus on the same thing yourself, in other words, the unloving demands that are inside of you, of others. And if we all start focusing on that, this world could change in one generation because it would multiply. You know what loving people are like. They're very attractive, aren't they? <laughs> Don't you like being with loving people and you find it much more difficult being with unloving people? Like... And the more and more loving you become, the more attractive you will become to others and the more they'll want to ask you why are you becoming more attractive like this and why is this changing around you and then they'll learn the same things you do and hopefully have the same desire to change and, and before you know it, the whole world can change. And then factor in the, play, the, the whole mix that God also has this overall plan to bring it into place and that there's all these changes that are happening environmentally, like coming up, there's going to be changes to do with the economy. We're going. To, many of you are going to lose all of your money. How are you going to feel about that? Now, straight as soon as I say that, a lot of people are going to fear. All right, I've got to buy some gold, and I've got to buy some, you know, seeds, and I've got to, buy, you know, because we are in a state of fear, and that's what generates the problems. And so we need to deal with those emotions. And 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 then what happens when earth changes occur? What happens when those events start getting triggered with more intensity? You've already seen them intensifying over this last six-month period. What happens if they get more intense over the next six-month period? And then they get more intense after that in the next six-month period to such a point that half of Australia breaks off with different areas and all sorts of things happen and 
Like, how are we going to respond to that? Well, if we don't deal with our emotions, what we're going to do is respond to it in a very unloving manner. That's what we're going to do. And whether whether we reincarnate or not, we're going to have that on our plate come 6, 12 months, 18 months. Like, we, so we're going to need to bring ourselves into harmony with love. At some point, God has taught us to do that, is trying to teach us to do that. So my feelings with reincarnation is there are also much spirit influence at play and I've written a document about that. as a 100-page document that you can download on the net called Reincarnation and Divine Love that you can read that I actually start illustrating a lot of the things about what spirits do in the interplay with humans to cause humans to believe in reincarnation as well. Um, so that can be read as well as a part and I've had a whole talk on reincarnation as well about the whole complexities of it. But uh, but can you see, uh, underlying our basic premise, a lot of times we're coming from this perspective that that there's this limited life on here on earth and I want a second go at it, when actually there's this eternal life that's ahead of you. And trust me, when you get to the second sphere of the spirit world, you, you won't want to be coming back here. You just won't be. You, you'll be going, what? Go back there? I wouldn't even dream of it, you know? And if you talk to many spirits who are in the second sphere, location or above, many of them say, I would never consider going back to earth. There's no need for me to go back to earth. Why would I bother doing that? Right? But the earth is a beautiful place for us to learn the basics of progression and that's why God created it. Um, can we go to Mary because Mary wants to make a comment? And then across... Thanks. I just wanted to talk about the issue of uh, potluck. That was really challenging. Um, I feel like the reason why a lot of people are very comfortable with the um, teaching of reincarnation is because there's a lot of injustice in the world and we're always seeking to understand why is it harder for someone else than it is for me or why have I got it harder than that other person. And I think um, people will stumble upon upon reincarnation because they feel, oh, well, there must be some justice in there. There must be, um, they must have done something bad and so that's why they get a bad deal or maybe I'm paying for something bad that I did. And for me, um, God is, is not like that. God is not punishing. God never wants one of us to suffer. And uh, it's actually more confronting to think that, yes, it is potluck um, because God did create the opportunity for anyone to incarnate based on the person, only the personality of the, the parents. I'm getting to a point here. <laughs> um, so it's actually loving for you to incarnate incarnate anywhere and we're confronted with the fact just as AJ was saying that mankind has actually become very unloving and many of us don't want to face that truth and we want God to be a God of retribution a God that's full of judgment and a God that sort of ekes out punishment and the God that I know doesn't do that <laughs> um, instead God wants each of us to recognize where we're out of harmony with love and that's why um, I feel that the way of the universe actually is more loving because it's challenging every one of us on the planet to recognize how out of harmony with love we are because so many people do without so much and falling back on the teaching of reincarnation uh, lets us get away with that because we say, oh, they must have done something wrong. Um, we may need to change the batteries in that. Um, can we have the back microphone down the front a little because it's the front one might needs to be changed a bit. If we can come down here. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Hi AJ. Um, my question is going back to the divine love and the natural love. Mm -hmm. Now, I may be wrong, but in the pageant messages, they mention, or God mentions, that he's actually going to sort of close the portal um, and sort of there'll be a cut-off point. Is, have I got that right? Yep, you've got that right. Um, so can you expand on that? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Um, God... 
the way God operates is God gives gifts that you have the choice to receive or to reject. And God began giving the gift of her divine love, firstly to the people you know as Adam and Eve. Their real names were Ammon and Aman. And what happened was that Ammon and Aman rejected the divine love. What they did is they actually rejected God. They decided they wanted to become self-reliant. Now, in the process of rejecting God, they automatically damaged their own soul because there's an automatic part in your soul that longs for God. And when you reject God, you close that part of your soul. And when that part of your soul gets closed, a lot of other damage occurs as a result of your actions. So the subsequent generations of mankind could, could not even receive divine love because of this part of the soul being closed and because nobody in the subsequent generations until my coming in the first century actually wanted to open <clears throat> that part of their soul. When there was a person on earth who wanted to open that part of the soul, God gave the gift again of receiving divine love. And I was the first person to receive that gift on this planet. And there's obviously other planets and other systems and who knows who's received the gift there, but in this planet, that's the way it's been. Now, God has now kept that opportunity open because there are many people receiving it for the last 2,000 years. And one of the reasons why the, the 14 have returned, the seven soulmate pairs have returned, is, is to actually give the opportunity of receiving this love to extend that opportunity to every person in the universe, not only people here on earth in every walk of life, but also people in the spirit world, in the dark places of the spirit world who haven't even known of this opportunity yet. Now, what God has done is also God has other gifts to give us other than divine love. Divine love is one of the many aspects of God's nature. So if you can think of God as this big soul, an, an entity, as I pointed out before, and God decided to bestow, firstly, upon humanity the opportunity to receive her love, her divine love, which is very, very different than the love that's inside of me. Love inside of me is my natural love. The love that comes from inside of me towards you is my love generated by my own soul. But the love that you have the opportunity of receiving from God is God's love generated inside of her soul to give to you, and that love transforms you. My love can't transform you in the same manner. My love can only change you through what you hear and through how you experience me, but God's love actually transforms your soul. It actually changes you. So what God did was gave to all humankind, so here's our soul here. Remember, we're a half of a soul at this point, so maybe I should draw it a little different. I'll just draw it as a half. So God gave our half of the soul, let's say in your case the feminine half of the soul, the opportunity to long for her love that would begin transforming your entire soul because it's somewhere out there is your gender attraction another ma a male or a female? It's, you might male. it's male, okay. So your soulmate is probably male. right? And as you start receiving this divine love, this entire soul starts getting transformed. Not just your half, by the way, right? Because the soul is a complete unit, and so the entire soul starts becoming transformed. Now, as this entire soul starts becoming transformed, it grows, and 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 eventually it'll grow, and the two halves will unify, and you'll get to the point of the 20 seconds for your state, where you're in a soul union state with your soulmate, perfected in love with God, perfected in love with your soulmate in that state. So let's say this soul now has grown to be this huge thing. We'll just write down their growth. Now in this state, in this new state, which we're not yet available to us here because we're now in this state here where we're just beginning our path of growth, in this new state it's capable of receiving new things from God, different things other than God's love, right? So love was the first thing that needs to happen to us to transform our soul. But there, there I believe there's other things that will transfer our, transform our soul even further 
Does that make sense? But the only trouble is that only the people who have received the divine love can actually receive the extra gift. Does that make sense? Because you need to first make the transition in love before you're ready to receive the next gift from God, whatever that gift is. So all of those who have made the choice to receive divine love will have received it and therefore are on this path of growth where eventually they'll have another opportunity extended to them to receive another part of God. Maybe not her love, it might be just as a hypothesis, it might be her wisdom or it might be some of her power or it might be some other attribute that God has. But the people who have not received this love will not have the capacity to receive this new attribute. Does that make sense? Because you need the love in order to receive it. So it's, so it's not like um, those that have only reached the natural love, once that portal's closed, can no longer go... I mean, they won't be able to go anywhere else, though. Well, they, they will stay in that natural love and that's it? Well, we don't know for how long. We just know that it's going to happen... Um, and I'll explain why. What happens in the spirit world, and this is something that every spirit in the spirit world does understand, is that, remember I wrote down the word growth there. There's a, there's a basic thing in the spirit world that growth, this is a basic, basic truth, must happen. In other words... In the spirit world, just like here, a person can never remain stagnant. Even if you desire to remain stagnant here on the earth, things will happen to you that cause you to not be stagnant. Does that make sense? For example, you might decide to sit in your own house and you decide you're never going to exercise again. You're going to be totally stagnant. You're going to go into rebellion against anything and you're going to be totally stagnant. So you'll be sitting there for a month and after a while there's no food. So what will happen? You'll either be motivated to change because there's no food or you'll die of starvation. Either way, you'll change. Can you see? Change is the only thing that is possible all the time. right? Growth must happen. And when I say growth, positive growth also must happen. Now, the problem with the people who have never received divine love and who have rejected it, so I'm not talking about the people who don't know about it, I'm talking about the people who have rejected the opportunity of receiving it. The problem with them is that they are now in a place in the sixth sphere, so they are in this sixth sphere condition, right? And they are not growing because they can't grow. They can't grow to the seventh sphere without receiving divine love. Now, in the Bible, have you heard of the term a sin against the Holy Spirit? you heard that term? Some of you religious may have heard that. In the Paget messages, we also use the same term. And what we meant by that, it was a sin against love. See, when you decide to remain stagnant, you are making a choice against love. Can you see that? You're making a choice to not grow. You're making a choice to remain stagnant. You are making a choice against love. Every single person who finishes up in the sixth sphere and who doesn't want to grow from that location, has made a choice against love. They've chosen to reject the gift that God has offered. Now, let me put this to you for a moment. In a simplified form, let's think about this. Let's say I'm a person here on earth, and I've got a child, and it's Christmas time. And I give, I go out, you know, spend a few hours, you know, looking around for a shot, for a present and everything. I find just the present that I think the child would want. I come back, wrap it all up, you know, put the card in everything, put it on the, put it on the underneath the tree. And the child comes along, picks up the gift and says, I hate you, mum. You shouldn't have given me that. I don't want it. And just like puts it down on the ground and just stamps on it. Right? Let's say the child does that. Would you be inclined to go out and get the child another gift that Christmas? So next Christmas, what would you do? You go out, let's say you get a gift again, you've decided to forgive the child for the last <laughs> little episode. You go out to get the gift again, you bring it home, you wrap it all up and do all the same thing, and the child does the same thing to you. What are you now starting to do? What, what, 
Is it wise for you to buy the next gift? Why not? Is it because the child has rejected the previous one? Can you see that? Like, and they've positively rejected it. They've taken action to reject it. Well, what's happened, what's going to happen here on earth is during this phase of, you know, and it might be a few hundred years coming up now, what's going to happen on earth is that every single person on earth and in the spirit world is going to be offered the gift of divine love. And you know, some people are going to reject it. They're going to do the same as the child done to the gift. Right? So, so what will happen for those people is they've made their choice to remain perfected as natural people, natural humans. It's not a place of unhappiness, but it is a place where you feel like something is missing. And these people in the sixth sphere will maybe be offered the gift again at some point in the future by another person who has received the gift. But for the ones who have received the gift already, they are already growing. They are already way beyond the sixth sphere, growing, 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 and they are ready to receive lots of other gifts. And so for a period of time, it might, the, fear, the feeling from God is, to celestial spirits is, that there will be like no more love offered to those people who have rejected it for a period of time until those pe people feel the longing of what they're missing. Does that make sense? And you mentioned that has happened before your first incarnation, that there was a time where that had happened. That happened in between the time from Ammon and Amman to my coming in the first century, and it will certainly oh, happen again. That makes me feel And better. it will probably happen again and again. Who knows how many times it might need to happen. And it was that statement did bring up fear about just it being forever gone. Yeah, yep. You know, so. Well, the, the thing we need to bear in mind too is that gifts – are beautiful things. And love is a gift. Every love, every little bit of love you receive from any single person your entire life is an amazing gift. And it's that gift of love that needs to be fully appreciated and, and we need to have full gratitude for that gift inside of us. And we need to understand that while we have this gratitude, further gifts of love can easily be given to us because we're open in this gratitude place. But when we're, in, when we're in an ungrateful place, we are actually pushing love away from us. And, and in that space, we are, we are in a lot of danger personally, uh, really, because we're never really grateful for the love that is the gift that we're receiving. And so if you can, in all of your interactions with every person, Think of love as a gift. When you give it, it's a gift given freely, without strings, without demands, without expectations. And when you receive it, when it's given to you in a way that's without demands, without expectations, and given to you as a gift, it's such a beautiful thing. It touches your soul. And that's the kind of love God wants to give you, exactly that kind of love. And if we receive it with gratitude, which, of course, if you're open, you'd want to do, then you will grow infinitely. If you, re if you notice it's there, ready to be given to you, but you're ungrateful for it and you don't want to receive it, then, of course, there's going to be times when it's perhaps not available to you. And one of those times is what we called in the pageant messages the closing of the celestial heavens. Yep. 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 I was more concerned for other family members that, don't want to know anything about divine love. Now, that is driven by an emotion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's driven by an emotion of, you see, on earth we have a lot of familial emotions, family-based emotions. And these emotions are very distorted in their nature anyway because why would you have more feeling for a family member than for any other person in this audience? You see, we're all brothers and sisters. Oh, I could, could start looking at friends and other acquaintances and yep. go further and further and have that fear for for all of human race. Okay, let's but do it that. Did start with the family. <laughs> doing that is actually more loving. Yes, yes. Having a fear yes. for all the human race is yes, more loving than yes. having a fear just for your for family. The family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but even then, fear isn't loving in it, in, it, in no, itself. No. So the fact that I'm in fear about some issue means that I have an emotion. So what's the emotion? The emotion might be. Oh, I miss out. <laughs> okay, what are you missing out on? 
of divine oh, love. <laughs> no, no, so you're worried about them. So what are no, you? No, no, this is me. <laughs> ah, okay. See, so see how everything gets personal. Yeah, yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. And and so the beauty uh, is that if we just say, all right, I have been personally offered this gift of divine love by God. I have the opportunity to receive it. I can receive it now. I don't know if it's always going to be available because it's a gift. Just like your husband giving you the gift of his love might not be always available. He might decide after 20 years of being rejected that he doesn't want to love you anymore and go on to another person. Yeah. Well, can I say, when you said that it's not closed forever, there was so much relief <laughs> relief inside, you know. Um, and I thought, yeah. No, no let, let me restate. I said it may not be closed forever. Oh, well. <laughs> so don't you go down that line to avoid your emotion. Okay. You see, you see, I don't know what God is going to yep. give you. Yep. Do, do you understand? I am not God. I don't know what God is going to give yep. you. Yep. I don't know when God is going to stop the gift. I don't know that either yep. because that is God's choice and God's decision, of which, by the way, I have no knowledge. Now, I can only suppose what will happen based on what I've felt from God, based on the connection we have with God. And every celestial spirit who's ever been in the celestial spirit world has that same connection and can feel these feelings from God. So, so we can feel these things, but we can't say for certain what God is going to choose to do. God's got control of her own universe. Yep, yep. She's allowed to make choices even that you disagree with. Yep, yep. I know for certain that every choice God makes will be harmonious with her love, right, because that's been always my personal experience with God. But that doesn't mean she might make a choice that you might not agree with or somebody else might not agree with for that matter. So don't go along thinking, oh, oh that means, oh, phew, I've got time, that means, you know, I've got... I've got thousands of years to make this choice, so what I'll do is I'll play around a bit more. I'll, you know, do my moral stuff that's not out harmonious with love, and I'll keep my beliefs that's not very harmonious with love, and I'll do this and I'll do that. And when it gets right near the end, when God says, I'm going to take it away from you shortly, then I'll do it. Oh, that's, that's not my intention. But, no, <laughs> but, I know that's but. not your intention. <laughs> so, so do it now. Yes, Whenever yes. you're offered this gift of love from anyone, take it. Gifts, need to be yep. felt like with gratitude. And whenever anybody offers you a gift of love, receive it, particularly if it's God. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, AJ. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not going to stop for a break, by the way, so those of you who are dying to go and do it, we, you might need to continue because what I'm going to do is stop at half past nine, okay, rather than otherwise we stop and we lose the flow and getting started again is pretty difficult. Can we take the microphone, um, one of those mics right up the back there? There's two ladies with their hands up there. Thanks. You had a question? Um, is it on? It, it just takes four seconds, that's all. Hello, hello. That's it. It's not on. Is it on or off? That's it. That's better? Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm feeling an awful lot of responsibility on this path. Why? To <laughs> feeling that um, be people, other people knowing that I'm on the divine love path mm -hmm. and getting a picture of the divine love path through my actions mm -hmm. and feeling very responsible to understand the path well and to take action in truth. The only um, problem with that, though, is that it stops you from being yourself and allowing yourself to develop. Can I, can I just say one thing to you? You're allowed to make mistakes. Do right? Of mistakes, yep. Like, how many of us <laughs> make mistakes? Okay. You, you, you've got good company. Right? Let, let me just write that down, actually. I think it's the Virgo in me. God says... I, I do this all the time. Eh? I'm thinking so fast that I can't write as fast as I'm thinking. You are allowed to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. 
You see, God gave you free will, which means that you're allowed to make mistakes. You're even allowed to make mistakes on purpose, which are not really called mistakes anymore, are they? But they're called purposeful errors. You're allowed to do that as well. So you're allowed to make mistakes. Now, anybody who looks at your life in this particular moment and says, oh, but you're not practicing da-da-da-da-da, how you say you should be, you just say, yeah, I know. It's terrible, isn't it? I made a mistake. You know, and I do make mistakes and I need to clean up my act with that. But you're not responsible for their judgment of you. Can you see that? At the moment, what you're doing is you're receiving this judgment. Right? And actually, it's, you're letting this judgment enter you and you're feeling responsible. You, uh, you're feeling like that, oh, from now on, everything I do is under a microscope. And while other people certainly, in their state of judgment, will put your life under a microscope, that doesn't mean you have to accept the microscope. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't mean you have yeah. to accept that you're bad because of their judgment. You are allowed to make mistakes, and to be frank with you, you definitely will make mistakes on the divine love path. So allow the, yourself to see them. You see, a lot of times it's because we don't allow ourselves to make mistakes that we get so tied up emotionally and then we don't act. Like, let's say today you're in an emotion and the emotion is, um, well, I'm in an unloving relationship and I just feel I need to leave my unloving relationship because something happened today. So you go down to the motel tonight and you sleep by yourself down in the motel. And then halfway through the night you process an emotion. The emotion might be, wow, I just realized that he didn't reject me. He was actually trying to tell me a truth, but I felt it as rejection and I've, you know, and you go into this rejection from your dad and never getting things right with your dad and before you know it, you come out of that thinking, wow, my partner in yesterday's argument, he wasn't actually rejecting me. What he was actually doing was treating me lovingly by telling me the truth. Wow, I just made a mistake. I made a mistake by walking away when in reality he was being loving and it was my emotional error. What do I do? Well, I go back and I say to him, I made a mistake. <laughs> and he might accept your mistake or not, but God certainly will always accept, particularly when you're humble, any mistake that you make. Right? So, so you are allowed to make mistakes and you are allowed to not be perfect. And the truth is that we're not going to be perfect until we're at one with God. So, so how can we ever get at one with God without making mistakes? The answer is we can't. We, we have to actually go through this process of making a mistake and then realizing them. Like I've, on this path this time, because I started in the first century, it was a bit different for me. On this part, on, in this life, because we came with the purpose of teaching people how to do this from a condition of emotional error, I have been in a lot of emotional error. And so I've had to recognize these errors that I've been in. Like one of the errors that I was in quite frequently was because I didn't trust myself very much, I trusted what everyone around me said all the time. And so what happened was, you know, a medium would come up and say such and such. I'd go and investigate that because I trusted them more than I trusted myself and my feeling. And it's led me down many wild goose chases as a result. And I've learnt after a while, wow, that happened because I didn't trust myself. Right? I made a mistake. I'm, I'm not trusting my connection with God here. I'm trusting another person to tell me my life instead of trusting my connection with God and God to tell me my life. Right? So I had to learn that lesson. Up until that time, I made lots of mistakes on that one subject. Right? There was also um, there was also one time where I believed somebody was my soulmate who wasn't. Right? And I investigate I investigate that. Right? And then I woke up one night, middle of the night, oh, I processed a heap of emotion about about this relationship, and I woke up realizing this isn't my soulmate. It's quite obvious now. I don't know why I couldn't see it the day before, but I processed a heap of emotion in that process. And then somebody else came along and told me that such and such was my soulmate. So I go along and meet them. No, they're not my soulmate. What was I doing then? I was trusting somebody else to tell me who my soulmate was. Again, that didn't work. Does that make sense? Because there was another thing I had to learn, another thing of trusting and another mistake. Now, 
nowadays what will happen is a whole heap of people will talk about those mistakes to you and say, oh, he can't be Jesus because he made those mistakes. Right? Well, what I'm telling you is I came to show you that you're allowed to make mistakes. And as you progress closer and closer to God, you'll make less and less of them. And when you become at one with God, you won't make them anymore. Right? But how can you how can you allow yourself to make them when you're being judged even by yourself about making them? So at the moment, there's this judgment coming from yourself towards yourself about I've got to be perfect. And the problem with that is that it locks you up into this little box because your definition of what's perfect right now and other people's definition of what's perfect right now for you is very, very different to what God's definition of what's perfect is. And so what I do is I lock myself in, up in my definition of what's perfection and I'm afraid of anybody's attack on me because any, the truth is that as I progress and as I confront truth emotionally, I'll confront truth from other people emotionally and so sooner or later what will happen is they'll become confronted and they'll want to attack me and so they attack me in any which way they can and they're going to attack you in any which way they can. And if you're in this place of, oh, I've got to be perfect, you, right at that moment you're going to stop progressing and that's a very dangerous place to be. You don't want to stop progressing. So for all of you who are wanting to be perfect before you begin, <laughs> stop that. What I had to choose myself was that I realised that I could, I could wait until I'm at one with God again before I teach all of these truths to you. All these things that I remember... I could just hold on to myself and uh, because I'm worried about how much you're going to judge me, I could hold on to it myself. I could go off into my little country property that I've got, sit there by myself, working my way through all of the issues that I have emotionally myself and then come out of that process perfected at one with God and then once I become at one with God, I could then go and teach it to the world. That, that was a very tempting idea. <laughs> uh, can you see why? Because from because because then anybody saying things about me or whatever, I know that I'm perfect and and it'll all just be water off a duck's back. But now it's not, because I had to come to terms with the fact. All right, I need to allow myself to make mistakes, and I also need to show you that you're allowed to make mistakes too, in the same way. So what I had to do is decide. All right, am I going to wait until I'm at one with God before I teach all these things that I know, or? Am I going to start teaching them now and come what may, law of attraction, to refine me? And the beauty of what come what may is that all sorts of things came. I had to make choices and decisions. I, you know, I'd be feeling and feeling feeling. Oh, eventually I was feeling like, mm, it's my soulmate's in Queensland. I need to go to Queensland. So off I go to Queensland, you know, I come up here by myself, stay in a place in Brisbane for a week. I decided I was going to visit a few spiritual churches. Did that for a day and that was a bad idea. So, so I, stopped, <laughs> I stopped doing that. And then I decided, well, the better thing to do is to surf for the rest of the time. So, <laughs> so what I did is I went up surfing. And then while I was surfing, I had this idea. I had to see this medium. There was this person that I'd heard about years before and I knew she was up there somewhere. And, you know, I've never met her before anyway. So, so I decided... I'll go and see her. Now, that might have been a mistake too, but anyway, I go along and see her and she says, oh, she starts telling me all these things about myself that I already know, but anyway. Um, but she was doing her mediumship thing and, um, and then at the end she's quite fascinated because of all the things she heard from her spirit guides and so she's saying to me, there's a guy I want you to meet. And so I go, no worries. Like, let your law of attraction bring you these things. So there's a guy I want to meet. So I, I met this met this fellow. I rang him up and said, "Ah, oh. he said, ah, oh, this sounds really good." You know, I talked to him about the divine truth. This sounds really good. Um, I've got this place that underneath my house that's big, as big as this room actually. It can fit hundred people probably. And uh, he said, "Come and I'll invite a heap of my friends along." So I said, "No worries." So I went up to Queensland again, and uh, and in that time I met my soulmate's parents. That was the time I met my soulmate's parents when I went up again. Anyway, I didn't know that at the time. My soulmate, she's Mary, was over in Beirut and in Lebanon, and uh, and like I, I didn't meet Mary, I just met her family. And not only that, I met a whole series of other people, many of whom are still 
um, listening to the truth today. And, and in that process, I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> but every single thing that happened led me to finally meeting my girl, Mary, to actually getting a property up there that I felt we could emotionally process. I, I actually bought the property before I met Mary. And so, so I, I was thinking in my mind, you know, I've, I've had a hard time emotionally. You know, I need a place where you can yell and scream without being heard. <laughs> so I decided I wanted to get a place that Mary could do that. So, so I just went ahead with that. You know, it could have been a mistake. Like, like I didn't know at the time. I just, it felt like right. So I had to go ahead and do it. And, uh, and that's the thing. What will happen with yourself eventually is it will feel right. You'll go ahead and do it. And then eventually a lot of things you feel are right turn out to be very right for you. And you'll start realizing this power of this connection that you have with God as a result. And then you won't judge these mistakes because so many of the mistakes actually lead to so many other things that you'd be surprised to, to about. Because remember earlier I said all of God's laws are perfect. And for that reason, all of God's laws, no matter how you react with them, eventually will bring you into harmony with God if you're open to the process. Yeah. Thanks, AJ. No worries. You wanted to say, Mary? Just, just that I have the same, I've had the same feeling, this responsibility of, um, especially because when I joined AJ, obviously, um, he was a lot more progressed along this path than I was. And I felt, um, I'm with him now and I'm supposed to be a reflection of this path as well. And there's so much responsibility in that. Um, and it really locked me up for a while. And I had to process a couple of things. One of them was fear of people's attack. So that's something for you. Um, and, I mean, that was the basis of it. The second thing was that I feel so passionately that it's such a beautiful truth, there's such a beautiful path. I don't want to ruin it for anyone when they look at me and then go, oh, if that's what it's about, I'm not going there. Um, but, but what I decided was that I was going to live the path passionately and I was going to have two qualities, humility, so humility to see when I'd made a mistake and vulnerability to share what was happening with me at all times. So, yet people would see me in my mistakes but then hopefully they would see me when I'd grown in love. Um, so that's the way I, I work through those emotions and I'm still working through them. I still sometimes get in front of the group and go, oh, that wasn't very good. <laughs> But I just try and remind myself to be humble about that, to feel the fear of the attack and also to um, to feel where why it went wrong, where was the error, so I can grow in love. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's, yeah, you guys are up the back first, sorry. Far away. Oh, son. You kind of answered my question already, but... What I wanted to say was I have this real fear about losing family and friends and I feel like to be on the divine love path I have to live outside of society and I, I wonder about how to live. Like I feel like I have to change everything and I struggle with, you know, my kids in school, all that sort of stuff. Um, no, to live the divine love path you are going to live in society. Um, in the first century, I said, you will let your light shine to the world. And what I meant by that was not remove yourself from the world because in, in that place, nobody can see you. <laughs> what, what you need to do is be in the situation you're in and then start practicing love and truth day by day in every moment. Now, sure, that is going to confront many things around you as a result. And so the truth and love will confront many of the people around you and some sometimes those people will treat you unlovingly and sometimes you'll need to remove yourself from those people who are treating you unlovingly but if you want to remove yourself from the world you're also removing yourself from your own law of attraction as much as uh, as much as you can which is actually quite damaging to your own progression you're far better off being in the world and dealing with issues of love moment by moment that's the real challenge the real challenge is to stay in the world but deal with the issues of love moment by moment. In regard to your, your statement though about family, the family issues are very, very important. You'd be surprised how many times you make a decision based on what the family wants you to do 
rather than what you want to do for yourself. Right? Now, one thing about the path with regard the divine love path is what we want to do is learn to actually have our own desires and follow them. So what God's trying to do with you is to teach you to have your own desires. Now, I don't mean just have them without acting upon them because they're not very strong desires if you don't act upon them. I mean to have them and act upon them, your own desires. Every time they're harmonious with love of yourself or others, act upon them. Every time you notice a desire that's not harmonious with self or others, feel the emotional reason why, but don't act upon it. So have your own desires. That's what God's trying to say. And particularly the desires that are harmonious with love, act upon them at every moment. Now, the problem for many of us is we are not having our own desires. We are having the desires of our family and our friends and our acquaintances and our workmates and our work colleagues and our employer and everybody else. But our, And for many of us, our entire life is built around the desires of others. Now, obviously, at some point, we're going to need to confront that emotionally. We're going to need to look at, all right, am I having my own desire here? Now, because of this, because we often are not having our own desires but having the desires of others, we often conform our life to what others want us to do automatically, right? Because we are so afraid of what they'll do to us if we don't agree with them, right? So, for example, many of you have had a feeling inside of yourself that with coming up earth changes, being on the coast is not a good idea. Right? Many of you have had that emotion. Many of you have not acted upon it because you've got a family and they all want to be here. Can you see? So a lot of the times what we're doing is we're not having our own desires and acting upon them. What we're doing is we're having everyone else's desires and acting upon them. And on the divine love path you will need to actually learn to have your own desires. And what that means for you is that at some point you will need to confront the hook you have into the family and why you want to do what they desire all the time. And confronting those hooks is going to be confronting not only for yourself emotionally, but also confronting to the people who you have the hooks into because they have certain demands and expectations that have always been met by you. And it's giving up those demands and expectations that causes their anger and rage at times. And I, as a person on the divine love path, need to at some point not become afraid of anybody's anger and rage anymore and instead still act upon my own desire even though other people are angry with me. And these are all things that I will need to learn to become at one with God. God doesn't have hooks into your desire. Do you know what I mean by that? Like you might desire to have a lolly right now but God doesn't have a hook into that desire. Right? What God does is God allows you to follow your own desires and hopes that you will bring those desires into harmony with love because if you bring them into harmony with love, you'll be happy. If you, bring them, if you don't act upon them in, when they're in harmony with love, if you act upon them when they're in disharmony with love, you will become unhappy. That's what God already knows. So God isn't hooked into you doing anything. God knows already that her laws are perfect. She's already created a perfect system. You are going to be unhappy if you break the laws of God at, in any level and you are going to be happy if you don't break the laws of God at any level. God knows that already. So God knows and God has no hooks into you. God has just love for you. Now in the end that's how you want to be with every single person around you where you don't have hooks into what you want from them, they don't have hooks into what they want from you, and you don't set up these codependent addictive relationships with them anymore. And all of these things need to be broken anyway. So let's break them and have the courage to break them. But that doesn't mean that you won't be with your family. right? It just might mean initially that it appears like you won't be with your family. 
if I can give you an example from my first century life, none of my family in the first century understood what I was talking about until the last year of my life. So they'd lived with me for nearly 35 years, right? and particularly the first 20, and none of them understood what I was talking about. My mother used to follow me around telling everyone else that I was crazy so they wouldn't hurt me. So she used to follow me around everywhere I went. And what she would do was whenever the crowd would get angry, she would yell at the top of the voice, he's just crazy, he's just crazy, you don't have to believe him. Huh? That's what she did until the last year of my life. My father didn't believe anything I said until I died. Right? And he had constant conflicts with me where he was try would be angry with me and upset with me and and he would be constantly projecting at me different emotions because I wasn't his Messiah. I wasn't what he expected the Messiah to be. There are many people in your life who who look at will look at you and say, You're not what I expected you to be. And in that moment, they are being unloving to you because they have an expectation. God doesn't expect you to be anything aside from loving. That's all. And even then, God doesn't expect it. He just desires it. Right? So, so if you can learn to have your own desires, what will happen is that you'll confront these hooks you have into your family and into your friends and into your acquaintances, and into your workmates, and your work, and everything. You will confront everything. But you will still live in the world. You won't, necess you won't be removed from it, and everyone around you will be attracted to you or repelled from you based on how much truth they want in their lives. So many of your friends will definitely change. That's for certain. And a lot of your family may totally disagree with your actions about you know, going on the divine love path. But what happened with my family in the first century is every single one of them, when they got to the spirit world, found the divine love path. Every single one of them. Every single one of them is now in the celestial heavens. Right? But they weren't like that on earth. Right? You know, Many of them were highly critical of me while they were on earth. So at some point, we have to make a decision inside of ourselves. Do we want to be at one with God as our first priority and then at one with yourself and your soulmate as your second priority? Is that what you want for your life? And if that's what you want for your life, you'll stick to the divine love path no matter what happens external to that. So your family will come and go depending on how much they agree with you or disagree with you at any one moment. Your friends will come and go, depending on how they disagree or agree with you at any one moment. But in the longer term, many of your family and many of your friends are going to be very grateful that you decided to stick to your guns and put God first and then your soulmate and yourself second in your progression. And that's what will happen. Yeah. Hi, AJ. Hey, I wanted to um, talk about, um, I, I have a passion about healing other people in my, in my life. Yes. And I wanted to know how the Divine Love Path works with um, healing methods like homeopathy, yep. how it sort of integrates that. All right. This all gets down to intention. If the intention of the person coming to you is to avoid the thing that created their pain, so so if their intention, so let's look at the intention of the person coming to you is to avoid the creation of their pain. In other words, they're not avoiding their pain, but they're avoiding the create the thing that created their pain. So, for example, a person comes to you with a bad lower back, right? They've been to many physiotherapists, they've been to a chiropractor, but they keep getting a bad lower back. So they come to you and they want to try to sort out this using the methodologies that you have at your disposal, 
The first question I would have to ask them if I was on the divine love path is, do you want to sort out the cause of this pain or do you just want me to cure the result of the pain? Because one thing I, I know for certain, and that is God never cures the results of pain without addressing the cause. That's why the majority of the human race, when they ask for a miracle from God, never get one. Because the majority of the human race don't want to deal with the cause of why they are sick. They want to deal with only the feeling of being sick. Does that make sense? So... So if the person wishes to avoid the creation, they wish to avoid, in other words, avoid the actual cause, which, by the way, is always going to be based around a belief or an emotion or a moral that's disharmonious with love inside of themselves, if they're unwilling to address that, then, then is it wise to cure them of the effect? Now, from God's perspective, God never does that. So if I'm at one with God, I would never do it either. Does that make sense? But, but in amongst that, there's a huge variety of things you can do to help any single person physically. And so my suggestion is, firstly address with the person. Do they want to avoid the creational cause or do they want to actually look at the cause? If they want to look at the cause, you would love to help them and help them with any method you can to help them get at the cause. Sometimes homeopathy is going to help. Sometimes kinesiology is going to help. Sometimes other forms or, you know, Reiki is going to help. Other forms of different spiritual healings are going to help. Eventually, by the way, when you become at one with God, you won't finish up probably using any of those forms because you'll be able to just cure the person instantly if they want to deal with the cause, right? So you won't need to use something to cure them. But for the moment, we're not in that state, right? So... We could certainly use any of these other methodologies. But if the person wishes to avoid, is that how you spell avoid? No. <laughs> I just look at her and it's like, I'm just looking at her thinking, well, that's not avoid, it's like. If they wish to avoid the cause, then, then are they, um, then the pain is actually a reminder of that. Pain is a reminder that we're out of harmony with love. That's the purpose of pain, to remind us. And so, so if I take away a person's pain without focusing on the reason why they're in pain, can you see I'm actually taking away God's created feedback mechanism to demonstrate the problem? Now, if I'm at one with God, I would never choose to do that. Does that make sense? Yes. And if you base your entire practice on that, you'll be surprised. Because initially a lot of people say, oh, I don't, like, no one's ever going to come to me. Right? A lot of people feel that. But actually what we've found with some of the people who have actually chosen to bring everything in their practice into alignment with love, and to do that, like one, one fellow we know, he, he decided to do everything by donation. And... There's this other lady in New Zealand as well. She's a massage therapist. She now does everything by donation. Every massage she does by donation. Right? The beauty of doing it by donation, it means that she can ring them up and say, actually, I'm processing an emotion right now, so I can't have you come. Right? And she's come next Wednesday or whatever. So there's no tied contract in place. That frees up her life immensely. The other thing is she's found that because she's by, by doing it by donation, She's had to deal with the emotions regarding abundance, right? So when she got no donations, she had to go and have a cry about it and work out what it was about, right? And then you know what's happened? She actually now gets as much money that she used to get by charging, by donation, but now everything is based around emotions because now when they come to her, because it's done by donation, she's allowed to say anything she wants, Right? So she starts talking and talking about the divine love path and they're going, yeah, yeah, amazing, you know. She says, yeah, this, this, this thing here, you know, this pain you've got here, that's about this emotion. And she's quite spirit directed and she's often spot on. So this is about, and they go, oh, yeah, this is about, and a lot of the people are actually coming to have a massage and crying on a table as a result, right? Because she's now brought everything 
in her practice into harmony with the principles of divine love. And what's actually happening is it finishes up growing. People start hearing about this. Can you imagine? You're a massage therapist and you do it by donation. There's a lot of people who are going to be attracted to that initially. Right? And then when they hear you're dealing with emotions as well, some of those people will leave. And the other ones who want to deal with their emotions, they'll come. What kind of clients are you going to finish up happening? People who appreciate, who have gratitude, who love the fact you're doing it by donation, and who also appreciate dealing with their emotions, and you're there massaging them, and every time you massage them, it's a different place. The stuff's in a different place because they've moved something emotionally. So there's some rewards in helping them as well. And this is the beauty of doing everything in harmony with God's, God's way of doing it, is once you start focusing on the cause, do things by donation, focus on your desire, focus on your own emotions processing first, and you bring everything like that into harmony, you'll find that your practice will grow and all the people who are wanting those things will be attracted to you, which means your job also becomes easier. And that's what happens. So that's what I would suggest that you do. That, Thank you. That help? Yep. Um, it's already half past nine. Uh, time goes fast, eh? Um, I talk a lot, that's why time goes fast. Um, who else would like to ask a question if we come straight down to here? This will be our last question, I think. The mic's making its way down. Hello, AJ. Um, I'd just like to know how do you find out what is the cause, the creational cause of the problem, of the physical problem? Um, there's some very fast ways if it's physical. Um, the fastest way, if it's physical, is to feel the pain, is to actually allow yourself to feel the pain rather than trying to deaden the pain. You see, the pain is always a direct result of the emotional suppression of the underlying cause. So, so if you allow yourself to feel the pain, then you would generally always get the cause. For example, um, today I had this pain in my left shoulder. I've had it on and off recurring on and off for quite a few months now. It's like a pain that somebody punches you in the arm, you know, and it goes dead. That's what it feels like a lot. And uh, and it's related to my sadness with women. Now, every time it appears, what I do is I look at what just happened, what just happened in my life. So, so for example, uh, let's say you did your back end. Look at the five or ten minutes leading up to doing your back end. Right? And what actually happened in that sequence? What were you thinking? What was happening to you? What kind of things were happening in your life? What did you just, who had you just talked to? Everything. Look at everything. And allow yourself to feel the pain that's there rather than trying to deaden it. In the feeling of the pain, you will start, generally start crying because of the pain. When you start crying because of the pain, now you're in an open space to actually receive its cause. And generally, if you ask God for its cause in that moment, you will soon or very quickly thereafter know the cause. Now, that's probably the fastest way. You could go to a medium and ask them what the cause is. Or you could uh, use kinesiology and find out the cause. I've been trying everything like that for 10 years yep. and I still haven't found the cause. Um, my suggestion then is that you don't want to find out the cause. You see, everything you truly want, you will get an answer to almost immediately from God. When I say almost immediately, often, oftentimes it is immediately, at that instant that you truly want it. If you have long-term illnesses that are happening that cause you pain, it's because you don't want to know the cause, really, here. Emotionally, you don't want to feel the cause emotionally. So what I do in that state, because I've been in that state myself too, so what I do in that state is I pray to God about why I don't want to know the cause. What am I afraid this is about? So I actually talk to God, what am I afraid of? Why am I so afraid of knowing what this is actually about, this problem that I've got? Right? And a lot of times I've had to deal with quite a degree of fear before I've come to know the cause in those particular situations. 
Does that make sense? So whenever you're not getting an instant answer as to the cause and instant relief by processing an emotion, it's because you don't want to here, not here. Often we go, yes, I do. I want to avoid this pain. I want to avoid this pain. But that's not a real want to. That's just wanting to avoid the effect. Can you see that? When, I, when I'm in the state of avoiding pain, avoid in pain, like spelt like that, when I avoid pain, I am in the state where I'm avoiding the effect, right? I'm sorry, sorry, I'm avoiding the cause. I'm in the effect. And if I want to avoid pain, I'm saying to myself, I want to get away from this pain. I want to get away from this pain. But the problem is, do I really want to deal with the emotional reason why I have the pain? Now, in most cases, we don't. And that's why the pain goes on and on and on and on and on and it becomes chronic as a result of my desire to get away from the emotional cause. So whenever you have a long appearing pain, a long a pain that's going on for a long time in your life, whether it be emotional or physical, look really sincerely at what you're avoiding and go back to the time it began because there's something about the time it began... I know that. Okay, know that. that you're avoiding. Does that make sense? Yeah. So allow yourself to start really focusing on the time it began and what you're avoiding about it. And to be frank with you, often we do know it. Mm. Often we do know exactly it, but we're avoiding the emotion of it. Mm. And what we're trying to do is instead, we're going, oh, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, and we're focusing on the pain but we're not focused on the emotional cause of this pain because we don't want to feel about that. Can you say what it is? What, do you mean? what um, the event was 10 years ago? Well, no, it was 20 years 20 ago. 20 years ago. It was when um, my partner left when I was pregnant with our second child for no apparent reason and never gave me an explanation. Okay. And it's not a physical pain. It's an actual, um, not a pain that you feel, but it's a thing that affects my walking and my weakness. Of course. Mm. Yep. So so can you see how there must be motion still to process about that event? Yeah? Mm, yeah. Can you see also there's a link to that and that? I don't know that. I can't. I don't know about that. Well, I'll, I'll leave that one yes. for you to think about. No. I mean, I believe you, but I don't, I can't see it myself. No. The truth is, when you say you can't see it yourself, let's revise the statement. I don't want to see it myself. Can I just encourage you to make, to change the way you state things? When you say, I can't, you are basically saying that it's under somebody else's control. Can you see that? Every time you say, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't feel that, I can't, you are actually saying that your soul is under somebody else's control. It's not under yours. When you say, I won't, or I don't want to, right? you are now recognizing the basic truth that your soul and everything that happens to it, and therefore everything that happens to your body, is under your own control. It's under your own emotional control. Because every time you say you can't, you're actually projecting out to the universe that it's somebody else's responsibility. That's what you're doing. Who have you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Uh, you remember somebody else's problem? Yeah, they're always invisible. Right? When it's not, when, you see, this is how, what we do. When we say we can't, we make it somebody else's problem. And when we make it somebody else's problem, it becomes invisible to ourselves. Can you see that? We have an emotional reason to make it somebody else's problem by saying it's I can't, I can't all the time. When you say I won't, I don't want to, you are now recognizing that it is your responsibility. It is your control. It's under your control. So this issue is under your control. I won't allow myself to feel something about that issue. So pray to God about that. Why don't I want to? What am I afraid of? Pray in that direction rather than praying to God to show you. Because at the moment, when you're praying to God to show you, you're, the emotion coming out of you is, don't show me, don't show me. <laughs> don't show me anything that I don't want to see. That's what the emotion is coming out of you at the same time you're saying to God, please show me. So what's God feeling from you? Is God feeling like, 
yeah, she wants to know. Or is God feeling like, no, I can't show her, like she doesn't want to know. When I say I won't and I start owning that with God and I say, look, I can see that I don't want to do this, I don't want to see, can you help me to see why I don't want to see? Like just to know why, what am I afraid of? And pray about this fear of it. You'll find the fear will come up, which is the blocking emotion, and then underneath will be the actual emotion you need to release that causes your problem with your gait. Mm. Okay, no worries. Just last one, you reckon? Squeeze it in. <laughs> we'll squeeze it in. This, this will be it, though. How many are here today, by the way? There must be close to 100 initially. 76, was it? Yeah. Hi. Yeah, i um, just winding um, back a little bit in relation to the... Um, uh, people who are in the healing profession. Mm -hmm. um, I've been trying to lately um, to help people with the um, the bone path through the emotions, mm -hmm. but some people don't really want to do that because they don't want. I mean, is there? A, and this will clarify my um, doubt. I would love to start working by donation, and I would like to, um, yeah, just just do to help them to deal with their emotions as much as I can because I'm only learning too. Yep. But can I point out something to every person who's a therapist in the room? Every single person who comes to your person, who comes to you for any kind of therapy whatsoever, is your law of attraction. So if you have a group of people coming to you who are blocked emotionally and who want to remain blocked emotionally, that is a reflection of something inside of yourself mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. is attracting. Mm -hmm. Does everyone understand that? So what you do firstly, rather than saying to yourself, oh, I can't change this or I can't change that, the first thing you focus on is your own emotion about their blockage to feeling their emotions. Does that make sense? Right. So what you do is instead of spending time with them, trying to convince them to feel their own emotions, what you do instead is you say, right, I've got five people in my practice who are resisting dealing with their emotions. Mm -hmm. What do I feel when they resist dealing with their emotions? Do I feel frustrated? Do I feel this? Do I feel that? Do I feel scared of them? What, what do I feel? Now, for, for every single person, it would be different. So for you it might be, that actually you're afraid to tell them that you will only work with them if they deal with their emotions. Mm. Right? That you're afraid to actually say that to them, that I can only work with you if you deal with your emotions. I can't work with you under any other circumstance. Now, you might be afraid because you might lose some money or you might be afraid because you might, you know, they, they might be angry with you or you might be afraid because your friends might condemn you for it or you might be afraid because you have a feeling inside of you that you have to help everybody. Mm. Uh, but whatever that emotion is needs to be addressed. Mm. Does that make sense? When you address that emotionally, things will change with those people. Either they will want to deal with their emotions or they will naturally leave and not come back. Well, of course, if you're a member of a professional organisation, uh, then you won't be able to provide those services anymore because then you won't be accepted. Like you know, yeah, so you need to look at why am I yeah, still in a yeah, professional organisation that. yeah, that's yeah. unloving to myself? That's, yeah, that's right. That's part of it. Yeah. Of course, not everyone um, doesn't want to deal with their emotions, mm -hmm. but then it's something that I yeah. There's some that that, that will, but mm -hmm. at the same time, uh, want to have a bit of the normal. Yes, the, they want to know, have their addictions met, yeah, the, shall we yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. yeah, certainly. Yeah. So what do you do with that? Does God meet any person's addictions? No. No, so what you do is you don't either. Yeah, now, no, now, that will mm. confront your working environment, it will confront the people who are coming to you and everything. The truth is... All of those things, including yourself, need to be confronted to be yeah. brought into harmony with divine love principles. At the same time, I don't feel because my progression is not like I only started not long ago. Yep. So sometimes I don't feel strong enough to to show them. Um, well, 
I what haven't done my workshops. What with you've Mary just given yet, me, you know, so. what you've just given me, is what I would call a self-deception. No, no, let me finish. No, let me finish. <laughs> 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 Whenever you say that I'm not ready to address this issue, you are not being truthful with yourself, ever. Can I just say that to everyone? Whenever you say I'm not ready to deal with this issue, you are not being truthful with yourself, ever. The reason why is the law of attraction has brought you this issue right at this moment, right? And if the law of attraction brings you an issue right at that moment, you are, from God's perspective, ready to deal with it. And if you believe you're not, you're just using your belief to get out of dealing with it. That's what you're doing. And that's what you're doing, is you're using your belief to get out of acting. Now, I have done this many times, and I know the pattern of it myself. It's so easy to do, to actually use an excuse to avoid the actual underlying situation. Well, I know the feeling, you know. I feel that I have this, like, I try to explain to people, I do explain, and if they don't want to, they, they can't understand, or they want, I feel that I have to carry, and it's, it's, it's a lot of weight, it's a lot of, it's a burden for me to have to constantly so, explain. Or, you know, so every time you feel burdened, are you harmonious with love of yourself? No. So, no. so there's some decision you're making that's out of harmony with love of self in that particular moment. Can you see that? Yes. So what's the decision? That you've got to help somebody even then when they're refusing your assistance. Well, that's, that's right. So I can't really do anything no, for no, them. No, that's I not that right. They're, uh, no. they're um, law of attraction. They're, sorry, they're um, free will. No, to no. decide whether they want to do that or not. And, and it's your free say, will. Well, look, and like it's your to... free will to work with them or not. And that's what you're not reco not realizing. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, do okay. not want to make the choice of your own free will. So you're willing to actually be unloving to yourself in that situation. Mm. And of course, it's going to feel like a burden. Mm. Of course. Mm. Every time you are unloving to yourself in any situation, it will feel like you've done the wrong thing. Mm. It will feel like a burden to your own soul every single time. And you see, the reason we've got to look at the reason why we do it. And the reason why we do it is that we have addictions of our own. One of those addictions might be to money. I need a regular income and I think that I need a regular income. Like, I gave up a regular income years ago. Like, so why do you need one? It's got nothing to do with me, Jesus. There's, there's millions of people on this planet who gave up having a regular income years ago. Yeah, but there's, there's so many things around that, you know. No, because no, no, there's no yeah, but. Well. <laughs> there is no yeah, look, but. Look, we still, like, we look after the environment, but I, like, I'm going to talk about myself about this. But like, can, I, can, I, can I just stop you for I a moment? I still drive a car, and that's not good for anyone, you know, and that's not loving. And I still drive a car, and I think we all here do drive a car. Yeah, that's I not, drive a car here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's. <laughs> There's that's no other way for loving. me to get to speak to 75 people. <laughs> so that's not loving. So I, st I still, I, I don't own um, anything. Can you see how you've just I justified yeah, an no, unloving no. action with another unloving action? Here's a loving action you can change. Like driving a car, you may not be able to change at this point to survive. But yeah. you can certainly change this other love, unloving action. Well, I have to pay rent. No, but see, now you're using justifications. No, it's true. <laughs> That's the trouble. That's the trouble with all justifications is they are always true. Right? Yeah. When, when Mary first came out to stay with me, she said, she said to me, um, how much money you got in the bank? You just happen to know how much money I got to make, right? And she said to me, "How can we survive when you've only got that much money in the bank? Like we're not working. You're not working." She said to me, "How can we survive?" I said, "Where's your trust in God? Like where you know where's dealing with the emotional reason why we haven't got a, why I haven't got abundance? If I deal with the emotional reason why I haven't got abundance, I have more abundance." She didn't believe me, right? And so. A months went past and eventually she did come out and she gave up her work. It required a lot of 
trust in your behalf of God, not of me, because I didn't have any money to give you either. <laughs> right? So, so it required a lot of trust. And in the process of dealing with our emotions, we got enough money initially to just make ends meet. And when I say just make ends meet, for myself and Mary, just making ends meet is about 150 bucks a week. Right? So I'd given away all my money and I'd given away every bit of resource I had and we were just getting about $150 a week, just enough to get our food and a little bit of extra things, right? And then I dealt with another emotion. And one time at one seminar, at one seminar we had donated to us $2,000, right? And Mary said to me, wow, like, <laughs> that's amazing, right? And and for $2,000 we could actually fix our car. So I actually, <laughs> before then I was... Driving, my, I was re relying on my son to drive me <laughs> to the places, <laughs> and then I, so we bought a two thousand dollar car, and uh, so we're driving around in little zippy, as Mary calls her, right? And and so this is this is true. We're driving around in little zippy, and we drive up at the venues, and everyone looks at the car and looks at us, and looks at the car. It doesn't even look like why well, we should have made it, let alone like. And 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 then after a period of six months. Even with giving away all the different things that we gave away, we got gifted to us things that meant that we could actually go and buy the car we've got now, right? Just, just with cash, just go and buy it. Well, the way it happened really was that I put it all on a credit card <laughs> and then within six months people gave us donations that paid it all off. So, so, so what happens now is we live week to week still exactly the same way Everything that we get in donations we spend again in terms of on usually on something to give away for free or whatever, but also some now we've learnt to spend some things at home to maintain home as well because home was getting pretty rough at one point there. And, and so what we've learnt is to have more and more love of ourselves to deal with the emotions. What you're telling me is that dealing with your emotions doesn't work. That's what you're telling me really. And you don't realise no, it. No, I understand what you're saying. That's really yeah. what you're telling me, though. Yeah. And and the truth is, while you have that emotion, dealing with any emotion is not going to work because you're not going to deal with the causal emotions that create the lack of abundance mm. in your life. Does that mm. make sense? Mm. And the truth is, at some point, all of us need to face up to this one fact. Every single thing in my life as an adult is my creation based upon my soul condition and if i really focus on that i will stop using excuses like oh, i've got to pay rent to actually live in my passion i will go and live in my passion and in the process of living in my passion the rent will get paid if i deal with the emotional reason why i don't have enough money to pay it and the truth is i've had to work through Lots and lots of emotions, probably, you know, 50 or 60 different emotions about money to live like I'm living now. I've had to work through so many emotions, ranging from they killed me for money in the first century, right the way through to really basic things that you wouldn't even think of, like, like I'm angry about money. Now, how many of you are angry about money? <laughs> but to Frank, how many of you don't like the fact that you have to go and get it? Yeah, see, you're angry about money. <laughs> a lot more people put hands up, the second question. So, so that's an emotion we need to deal with. If we're angry with money, of course we're not going to get any. Does that make sense? We're not going to get any very simply if we're angry with it. You see, in the end we'll come to love everything and that includes loving the money we receive and loving everything that we have that is a gift to us, right? But I had this emotion, I was really angry about money, angry about the economic system, angry about the way the government's created this control with taxation, angry about taxation, angry about all these different things, all covered over emotions that as I work my way through, more abundance comes. If the, yeah, if the financial system... This is more than one question. Now. Yes, I know. But it's so no, much. no, stop, Can stop. I? Oh, okay. You told me one question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so that's it. That's the question. <laughs> we have to raise it for another time. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to thank you very much for your time as well. I know that your time is precious to you and, uh, 
and it's also quite precious to me and I'm very grateful that you've given the opportunity to talk some truth with you. We'd also like to thank you for your donations that you've given to us, both the preceding coming down, uh, there's been a little pool that was given to us of, of funds, and, uh, and for any donations you've given us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate those. Anything that is beyond what Mary and I myself need, we uh, straight away feed back into providing things for free. So, so that's what will happen with your donations once Mary and I have paid for the expenses and whatever for getting down here and some living expenses, then what we do is we feed all of the extra funds back into um, getting DVDs done, buying equipment and so forth. So that's what happens to your donations. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for your wonderful question.